Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 19. And with me, as always, Amanda James. Hello, everyone. So last week, we talked about a motion that was filed on May 8th, 2024. And that was done by Lauren's attorney in an effort to remove him from probation effective immediately. And the government has until the 29th of this month to respond, and we're very much looking forward to that response. So in the meantime, what we wanted to do was take a step back. Let's go back in time and start at the very beginning. So Lorne was indicted on February 6, 2008, and this was his formal formal charge from the grand jury. And a grand jury is a group of people. They are not rendering a verdict or anything like that, but they're jurors who hear a bunch of cases about once a week or so for a few months. Every state's going to be a little bit different, but all they're hearing from is the prosecution side. And they're going to determine if there's enough evidence to move forward with a formal charge. So in Lauren's case, they reviewed his case and the evidence against him, and they decided, yes, there is enough here. So he was formally charged on February 6, 2008. So from there, everyone was assigned. The judge was assigned. The prosecutor was assigned. The defense attorney as well. And it moved rather quickly as far as getting to the stage of having a plea agreement to be discussed. Um, At least I feel like it's a little fast. I don't know if that's really the case, but um, there was a plea agreement that was presented. And so what we're going to do today is take a look at the letter that was sent to Lorne from his attorney And it was attached to that plea agreement. And we'll talk about the plea agreement next time um, because it's pretty lengthy and we want to have enough time to do that. But we did want to take a look at the letter that was sent with it because I think it has a lot of information in there. And also, we get insight to some of the advice that his attorney is giving to him. So take a look here. So this was sent on March 20th, 2008. It was sent to Lorne. His ass was sitting in Warren County Jail, fuming, I'm sure, a lot of tears. (laughs) And so we can see here that it's regarding the United States versus Lorne Lynn Armstrong. So we'll get started here with Dear Mr. Armstrong. Do you want to read it for the people? Sure. Dear Mr. Armstrong, we have received and sent to you for your consideration a plea agreement offer from the United States, which would result in a 60-month sentence, higher than the 46-month sentence the advisory guidelines would normally recommend in your case. You are currently charged with a single count of traveling in interstate commerce for the purpose of engaging in sexual conduct with a minor in violation of 18 U.S.C. 2423. The prosecutor is threatening to add an additional charge of attempted production of CP if you do not accept this plea agreement. He also indicates that failure to accept the plea agreement will result in any sentence in the state courts running consecutively with your federal sentence. Wow. They're just hitting him from the very beginning. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny because the very first sentence is like, yeah, you're, you're getting a sentence that that's more than what you could get. (laughs) Right. But they, they make it understood why. Oh yeah. The prosecutor is threatening to add a huge charge on there. Definitely. If he doesn't take this plea. Yes. Yes. Um, so let's take a look at what it says in the next paragraph. So the apparent reason for this hardened attitude on part of the government 
is the digital camera found in your possession at the time of your arrest. The government alleges that the camera was brought by you to Bowling Green for the purpose of taking pornographic photo photographs of what you thought would be a 13-year-old girl. Attempted production of CP is a violation of 18 U.S.C. 2251 and carries a mandatory minimum sentence of 15 years imprisonment without parole. Needless to say, if the government supersedes the indictment and convinces a jury that this was your intention, your sentence would be significantly higher than the offered 60 months. Yeah, that should have that should have sealed the deal right there. That's a scary thought. Um, and I think the prosecutor would not have a hard time convincing the jury of that, that that was his intention. Certainly, yeah. But I do wonder if this wasn't a part of the original indictment, like it wasn't an added charge at that time is if they felt like there could be a little bit of a defense there. Oh, um, otherwise you, you think they would have, um, included that charge to begin with? I think it's possible. Mm. Certainly someone else may know that any of the legal minds out there, you know, I don't know how it works, um, technically, but it sounds to me like why wouldn't they just automatically throw that out there? I don't know. Yeah, maybe you're right. Um, maybe they thought that they couldn't. I don't know. So knowing Lauren the way we do, it it just seems so obvious. That, oh. <laughs> you know, but I have to remember the jury did not know Lauren the way we do. They didn't. No. No. All they heard was just evidence. And they're just hearing it from the, the prosecutor's side. Um, but certainly, if you think about it, if Lorne would have gone to trial and he's in front of a jury of his peers and this, this issue comes up, certainly there is evidence to suggest that that was the direction that he was going. He talked about taking pictures and then he goes there and he has a camera. So what else would you deduce from that? <laughs> right. It's pretty and clear. I, yeah. I know perverted justice would ask them to bring certain things like food mm -hmm. um, or whatever. And it was to show intent, mm -hmm. you know, the, in the chat log, they talked about having sex um, and they showed up and they also talked about bringing pizza and they brought pizza. Mm -hmm. So it, it, you know, it's just like another nail in the coffin um, and Lauren brought the sterling silver bracelet, well, the gift that he said he was going to bring. He mm -hmm. brought the condoms like he said he was going to. And he showed up with a camera because he said he was going to take pictures of them together. Yeah. Do you remember what his gift was going to be if he had it his way? Was it a webcam? I do believe he talked about a webcam. Yes. But that was way out of Lauren's budget. <laughs> oh, um, no, I can't remember. I remember him saying that he wanted her to leave a pair of her panties yeah. with him. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to leave a pair of his boxers with her. Yes. <laughs> That's what I was thinking in terms of, okay. a, of a gift. Yeah. So he wanted to do that. But... You know, if mom and dad found that, they might think it was a little weird to find your boyfriend's underwear there. Yep. <laughs> they might think it was a little weird to find a 40-year-old man's dirty underwear in their yes. daughter's room. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. But that was his gift. What a <laughs> gift. What a gift. Here's my used underwear. <laughs> my dirty underwear. I know. He... I've said this before and I'll say it again. He's such like a, a woman in his mind. He's such a girl. Mm -hmm. That's a girl would leave her underwear behind for her boyfriend to find uh, men. I don't think men do that generally. I don't think, think so either. Say, like <laughs> they don't think I'm going to leave my 
my underwear with you so you can think of me it's not the same thing like men's underwear aren't sexy they're just underwear that's not nice (laughs) I think it's objectively true though like there are different standards to what I don't know how to say it but you know what I mean that's a feminine thing sure no I understand I understand so gentlemen anyone listening do you leave your dirty underwear at someone's house when you're trying to woo them is that your move I love and do you that. think your fruit of the looms are sexy <laughs> like AJ just... says no I don't think they are <laughs> I think they're just kind of like short I don't know it's not it, if men wore like g-strings or thong, which some maybe do, some do. Oh, we're yeah. way off it's still important though so <laughs> anyway let's talk about the weirdo that's in the in the document here um but yeah so he so you were saying that they talk about to them about bringing something because that's going to show intent and him bringing the camera, even though that was, that wasn't something that they asked for the fact that he brought it after talking about taking photos seems to make sense. And I Mm -hmm. think that, you know, as a, as somebody on a jury, you're not looking to, um, to have something be a hundred percent true because that's not the standard. The standard is beyond a reasonable doubt. So does it make sense that this is what is going to happen based on all of the evidence that's available? So I, I totally understand that that it probably a jury would find him guilty of that as well if he were to go to trial. Um, but I do think that he could have offered a defense there. Um, but it it would have been funny as well, because one of the things that he said was check the cameras at these pawn shops. Mm-hmm. I was there with the camera. It would have been interesting if they did do that and they didn't find anything. He wasn't there. <laughs> it would have. But that wouldn't that wouldn't um, cancel it out anyway, because he destroyed his own defense when he said, you know, I had my phone anyway. I could take pictures with my phone. Right. Yeah. So he had a, a device, even if he had sold the digital camera with duct tape on the back, mm-hmm. even if he had been able to sell that, he still had a device that he could take pictures with, with him. And he said that that was his plan. He wanted to take pictures of them together. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Um, but that is one of his defenses, though that he will bring up that he he had the camera in his white truck because he was trying to pawn it and get some money. And we know he was, he was desperate for money. Mm-hmm. He sure was. Yeah. So desperate. He spent the last of his money on condoms mm-hmm. that he wasn't going to use that night. Right. He just had them because he's going to bars. It would be ignorant. To yeah. not have condom, right? I think he says that in one of his, um, in one of his court papers. <laughs> he loves that word, <laughs> ignorant. <laughs> yeah. So, again, we have this threat from the prosecutor saying basically, like that you're gonna be looking at a lot of time, and we're gonna hit you with this mandatory sentence if you're convicted of that minimum sentence of 15 years without parole. That's huge. And they're also saying that um, that it's going to run concurrent with anything else. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, it's going to run consecutively with anything Right, else. one after the other, mm-hmm. right. Yeah, and that's such a huge deal. Mm-hmm. Because you're looking at more time. If they were if they were running concurrently, um, then I mean it's not great, right? But that's at least better because your time is going to count for more than just one sentence at a time. So yeah, yeah. The the more I think about it, the more Lauren really should 
thank his lucky stars oh, yeah. that he got out of this with only 60 months because we know that it was his intention to take those pi- we know he would have taken pictures look at how much he loves to take pictures of himself true and receive pictures that's like his favorite thing ever he absolutely would have wanted to memorialize his crime on his shitty digital camera yeah and he would have thought that it would stay hidden forever Mm -hmm. he'd be able to keep it a secret but yeah he would have taken pictures definitely it's too bad you know thinking about the sting when they're sitting there and he is asking about the gift or she asks about the gift and he said it's out in the truck do you want me to go and get it I wish they would have allowed him to do that because I would love to see what he would have brought in. Oh, or the way he would have handed it over, like yeah. like John du- Dupay. <laughs> yeah. The way he handed over the snacks in that really creepy way. I know. And that's what I envisioned as well. <laughs> oh, could you yeah. imagine his bashful face when he's showing her the condoms? The box of condoms. Yeah. Oh my God. Exactly. You know, I understand why they couldn't let, because, you know, they were afraid he was going to take off or mm-hmm. something. And sure. They wouldn't have gotten their footage. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I know. I, it would have been great to see him present her with that sterling silver bracelet. I know. <laughs> what a shame. But I wonder if he would have brought in anything else, like perhaps the camera. Oh, yeah, that would have, yeah. You know. Well, because they were supposed to leave. They were supposed to go back to his place. They were, but I don't think he was leaving. No, he looked pretty comfortable. Yeah. (laughs) Even Chris said so. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he sat there with his feet up the entire time. I know. That's one of my favorite things. I know. Awkward and weird. Yeah. Yeah. I wish that it was still, that heater was still on, so his ass was burning. Oh, but I bet it was too. And he was sweating anyway. Yeah. Because he's in this this, you know, high pressure situation. Mm-hmm. He's sweating. The chair is hot as fuck and <laughs> vibrating. <laughs> Snot. Snot. <laughs> yeah, oh cool. Jeez. What a what a tough night he had on his birthday. I know it was on his birthday. That was intentional. Well, he was being they trolled. They did that just to be mean. I know. They sure did. Under the existing single count indictment, the base offense level for traveling in interstate commerce for the purpose of engaging in sexual conduct with a minor is 24. To this would most likely be added two additional levels since the computer was used for a total advisory level of 26. If the prosecutor superseded the indictment to add a count of attempted production of CP and you were convicted, the base offense level would be 32. To this would most likely be added two levels because the intended victim was under 16 and two levels for the use of a computer to solicit participation of a minor in sexually explicit conduct for a total advisory offense level of 36. We've calculated your criminal history category as one. An offense level of 26 in a criminal history category of one results in an advisory sentencing range of 63 to 78 months imprisonment. An offense level of 36 in a criminal history category of one results in an advisory sentencing range of 188 to 235 months imprisonment. So here they're just going through what they believe the sentencing will look like. So it can either be a 24, which would be the scoring system that they're going to use for that, or it can be a 36. And there is a massive difference between the time that needs to be served for either one. So certainly looking at that, you would say, um, I think I'm going to go for the lesser one. Yeah, I think I'll choose the former. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, five years you can you can make it through that. It's a long time to be locked up, but it's doable, I guess. Mm-hmm. 
um, I mean, 15 to 25 years would be doable too. I mean, you don't really have a choice, but that takes a huge chunk of your life. It's a quarter of your life. Yeah. Spent in prison. And plus, if you're adding other charges onto that as well, that are just going to be stacked on top of it. And then they're going to have to wait for the sentence to be done for the first one that 20, we'll call it 20 years. Um, and then th- there could be other ones that are just going to be added. So he, he, yeah, he's to the old. grateful. Yeah. He, uh, in all the years when he's talked about how his lawyers didn't fight for him, he's crazy. If he had taken, if they, in order for them to fight for him, they would have had to take this to trial. And there is no way that that would have gone well for him. He could still be in prison to this day if yes. they had gone there. Yes. And unfortunately, they didn't. (laughs) We want that transcript. (laughs) I know. That would have been so amazing to see, to hear his chat log read to the jury. I know. The chat log, the phone calls, Mm -hmm. the singing. The webcam images. The webcam (laughs) images. I know that would have been so insane. Could you imagine being on that jury? You got your little summons, you walk into the courthouse, you're like, ah, I'll be out of here, you know, pretty soon. And then you get called and you walk into the courtroom (laughs) and there's Lauren. He's not wearing a hat. He's just looking at you. He's wearing his, um, the, he's not going to be in his inmate outfit. He's going to be, wearing, be, yeah. Maybe he's going to be in his handsome blue shirt. <laughs> That's what I was just thinking because the defense lawyers want, you know, want them to dress nicely. So he instruct his mom to get um, that oversized blue shirt with this huge <laughs> wide collar. Uh-huh. That was, uh, God only knows how old that thing is. And his best pair of dirty jeans. Mm -hmm. And it would look like the pictures he took uh, for Casey for (laughs) his date outfit. Or he would look exactly like, you know, the girlfriend video where he he gives her the ring in the video. Yes. That's what Lauren would have looked like at trial. A little bit more hair back then than he has now. But... Yeah. And minus the headset, of course, no headset. Minus the headset, yeah. But everyone hates jury duty, right? So these people going in there be like, oh, god damn it, I have to do this shit. And then day one, <laughs> they would be so eager to see because they would, I think they would immediately start reading the chat log mm-hmm. and showing the, the pictures. My favorite one, well, one of my favorites is when he is um, standing and looking over his shoulder with his pants down. (laughs) That's probably the funniest. I'm trying to think if there's a funnier one, but that, that one is hilarious. Why did you do that, Lauren? Why did you do that? (laughs) Well, especially because Lauren's defense was that he or this could be a defense that he's cooked up over the years, but let's, let's assume that part of his defense would have been that he was only saying those sexual things because he thought that's what she wanted in order for, you know, he just wanted her to keep talking to him because he was so lonely and fucking sad. (laughs) Um, And uh, obviously that can be ripped to shreds by just reading one page of the chat log where she's not encouraging encouraging any of it Mm -hmm. but you know to hammer the point home they would read you know is Mr. Penis thinking I mean is Miss Vagina thinking about Mr. Penis and um the part about counting her hair all of it reading the whole all the I could just imagine the prosecutor with the chat log just with the best parts highlighted all all the pages are just neon pink from the highlighter <laughs> right they're all important we're gonna go through yeah. this whole thing strap in ladies and gentlemen <laughs> you're gonna hear some sick shit but also some really funny shit too some really funny shit yeah so not only did this plea save lauren 
a decade at least of time of his life in prison, it saved him more, you know, humiliation and embarrassment than one person could ever handle. <laughs> I know. I know. But he doesn't see it that way. Because he never went back and looked at, I, I really think he never went back and actually looked through his chat log. I agree. He couldn't have. Why would he want to do that? Yeah. I really don't think he he did, even though he insisted that he said, no, there's all these times in the conversation. You can tell he's hesitant. He said, no, we can't do this. He never looked at it. And, you know, he'd have his mother there in court, his mother and like his aunt Sharon. And you think so? I do think he'd want his family there. Yeah. Okay. Because he's a little bitch and he would want. Yes. I don't think he would just let his mother, you know live in peace he would make her suffer through that with him right um probably have her write letters to the court in his defense like we know he did later but imagine having all that read in front of your mother i know well see i don't know that she would go she didn't go and visit him down there she didn't no no she didn't do anything she barely read his letters Well, maybe she, okay, he would have wanted her to go. Whether she would have gone or not is, you know, who knows. But I think he would have wanted her there despite having all those images shown. All the, and that's another thing. I wish we could get a hold of the footage of his webcam. (laughs) I know. That would be really funny. That would be really funny. So do you think that they would have played him singing to her? <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. I hope so. <laughs> maybe, maybe they would have, because his choice of song was, was suspicious, wasn't it? Yes. It was a song um, from the perspective of a father, like a paternal figure over his little girl. Right. Which is really weird to sing to your child girlfriend. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I guess you have to ask why, what would the purpose be if they presented that to the jury? Maybe That's just true. to just to reinforce or, you know, just to show the grooming that he put into it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they would have. I'm thinking probably not. No, I, I'm sure that they would. I mean, they can't make a total spectacle out of everything, even though it would be entertaining for us to to know. Like you're reading in the transcript and it says like plays Lauren singing. I loved her first. Well, I want them to ask him, Mr. Armstrong, why did you say, OK, sing to me so randomly in conversation? Because mm-hmm. that's always perplexed me. Really? See, I think that he he asked her that so that she could ask him. You think so? I mean, yeah. It, well, he must have because they had never talked about her singing. No. So it would make sense if she was like, oh, I'm a singer. I love to sing. It's my favorite thing to do. And then they finally yeah. get on the phone. He says, OK, sing to me. You know, we've talked about that before. He says, sing to me. That didn't happen. No, I know. It was really, really random. Like yeah, and even the decoy was like, sing to you. <laughs> I'm not used to this. I'm used to people being really perverted. You're just weird. <laughs> yeah. So, um, um, no, I don't think they would have played it. Okay. Disappointing. Disappointing. Well, let's talk about this next section here where it says, if you go to trial, because that's kind of what we're talking about anyway. Mm-hmm. So tell us, Amanda James, what it would be like if Lauren decided to go to trial. If you go to trial, the government will supersede the indictment to add the attempted production count. Um, If you are acquitted of both charges, that's the end of the case. The charges against you will be dismissed with prejudice and you will be free. If you go to trial and are acquitted of the attempted production count and convicted of the travel count only, your advisory sentence will be 63 to 78 months imprisonment. 
If you are convicted of both counts, your advisory guideline sentence will be 188 to 235 months imprisonment. Of course, as previously explained, the guidelines are only advisory. Both you and the prosecutor would be free to argue for any sentence that you or he deemed reasonable under the applicable sentencing statutes. However, we think it likely that Judge McKinley would sentence within the advisory guideline range. You or the government would be able to appeal any sentence imposed to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Also, you would have the right to appeal the resulting judgment to determine if any errors were made in the trial or to file a writ of habeas corpus if there were any errors that could not be presented on appeal, such as ineffective assistance of counsel. Okay, so Lauren has some options here thinking about going to trial. So the first one is, hey, you could be acquitted of both charges Mm -hmm. and you're just going to go home. You're going to be a free man. You can go back into Nashville and pursue that singing career. So that would be goal number one. And I'm sure that's likely the goal for all defendants. Yeah. That's the best, that's the best case scenario. And then also they're, they're talking about what could happen under different circumstances. If you go and you're acquitted of the production, here's what's going to happen if you're convicted of the traveling count and what those types of sentences would look like. Um, and they also mention what they believe the judge is likely to do. Mm-hmm. And that's really valuable information to know um, because this is a public defender. This is someone who works within the court a lot and is going to be familiar with all of the players. So to have that type of experience and to say, well, based on what we know about him, this is usually what they do. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's really good information. And I think an important note here as well is that they say you or the government would be able to appeal any sentence. When they're talking about you, they're talking to Lorne. Mm-hmm. So when they say it again, both you and the prosecutor would be free to argue for any sentence that you or he deemed reasonable under the applicable sentencing statutes. They're saying you because all he is is counsel. He's helping Lauren to navigate this process. He's going to help him understand the law. He's going to help him to um, come up with a strategy and how they're going to attack this if they decide to go to trial. But ultimately, it's the defendant. The defendant is the one who's on trial. The defendant is the one who's making the decisions. So while, again, the attorney is working to come up with a strategy, it's going to be all based on what the defendant wants to do. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, going on the stand, I'm sure that any defense attorney just wants to shrivel up and die when their defendant wants to go up on the stand because they know it's their right. They can't stop them from doing it. But there, there's going to be ramifications to that. Yeah, they'll get ripped apart on mm-hmm. cross-examination. Right. And yeah. while the defense is going to be able to redirect and hopefully maybe salvage some damage that's caused during that cross-examination, if you're in front of a jury, they're still hearing everything. Right. Yeah, the damage is done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and I've seen that play out as well. Well, we have Miss Jody Arias. Right. She's a great example. She's a great example. Yeah. I mean, you know, just at just with her example, we know the reason why she wanted to get up there. She thinks she's smarter than everybody and she thinks she can convince everybody of her that her story is true. Mm-hmm. No matter how unbelievable it is. She's so smart that she can convince anybody. And that's why she went and did what she did. Because as a defendant, you don't have to do anything. 
Right. It's the burden of proof is not on the defendant. Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, it's really, it's really up to the defendant is basically what it comes down to. So that's what, that's why they're saying here, you and the prosecutor can argue, even though the lawyer would be arguing on Lauren's behalf, but it's going to be based on what Lauren wants to do. So Mm -hmm. the attorney is going to handle like the, the legal heavy work, but Lauren's essentially going to call the shots when it goes to how it's going to go, what direction do they want to go in? So that would have been an interesting choice. (laughs) It would have. And unfortunately, Lauren did listen to the advice of his lawyer. Um, But the plea really was the best deal he was going to get because there was no way that he would have got the conviction for um, the charge for traveling, Mm -hmm. Um, traveling for, um, you know, to meet a minor or whatever that there, he, I mean, he confessed to it, but also, you know, just the evidence was overwhelming. So even if he didn't get um, convicted of the, the production count, it still said that he would have faced 63 to 78 months in prison. Mm -hmm. And the judge would probably sentence within those guidelines. So 63 is more than 60. You know what I mean? So best, best case scenario, if he took it to trial would have been 63 months, which is Mm -hmm. still three months longer than if he took the plea. Right. Yeah. Yeah, he de- he definitely made the right decision to go with the plea, even though we're going to see through all of these documents that we're going to go through that he wants to forget about that. <laughs> and he wants to say, no, but it's not right. I actually didn't want to do that. You know, I had bad representation. I wasn't told, you know, certain things. I wasn't, I wasn't defended properly. And I was coerced or I was threatened to take this, this agreement. But, you know, even though it says that the prosecutor's threatening to add on this, this massive charge, I mean, that's like somebody throwing on a murder charge, you know, and you're like, oh, if I take a plea, then I'm only going to get burglary or something. But then there's this murder charge that they can throw on top. Well, it's perfectly legal for a prosecutor to threaten mm-hmm. um, other charges when, right. in, when presenting someone with a plea agreement. There's right. nothing right. wrong with that. And it, I mean, Lauren takes it as, oh, threatening. So I my, my plea should be invalid because mm-hmm. I was threatened. Mm-hmm. They were telling him what would happen if yeah. he didn't take the plea. Exactly. It was more of a promise. Right. And then it's up to Lauren and his defense um, attorney to decide how likely it would be mm-hmm. to get convicted of that extra charge and whether it would be worth going to trial. Right. And the defense attorney, as any defense attorney, I'm sure would, you know, said the best move is to take the plea. You're going to get fucked if you go to trial. Yeah, because this, this plea agreement is a sure thing. Mm-hmm. It's already been agreed to. Now the judge doesn't have to accept it. I've seen that happen too. Oh. Yeah. 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 I don't think that it happens often because I haven't seen it often. Of course, this is just from observation, but they don't have to accept it. Mm-hmm. Oh, I've seen that before too. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking of a a, a hearing or yeah, a court date where the defendant was really, really disrespectful towards the victim's family. Okay. And he was trying to enter a plea and the judge said, you know, I'm tempted to, to reject this plea Mm -hmm. and not let you get out of it this easy. So you're right. That that can happen. Yeah. Yeah. So what it says for the next section, if you accept the plea agreement, Under the plea agreement, the government agrees that three levels should be subtracted for timely plea and acceptance of responsibility. 
that no further charges will be brought arising out of this matter, and that 60 months is the appropriate sentence. The agreement requires that you agree to waive your appeal in habeas corpus rights and agree not to seek a downward departure from your criminal history category or argue for any other sentence than that provided for in the, in the agreement. The plea agreement would be binding on the judge. So that makes it pretty clear. Mm -hmm. If you accept the plea, um, you're agreeing that you waive your right to appeal. Yeah. Which I think Lauren forgot about that part. But it's, it's really important, too, um, where it says that if you, if you take the plea, no further charges will be brought arising out of this match. Mm -hmm. So you take the plea. We're not going to turn around and try to charge you with production of CP anyway. Correct which is a really big deal. And I think Lauren was underestimating that charge and what that could do to his life. I think he thought it was like, a, um, you know, you can't prove it kind of thing. Like how he, he would always um, talk with the catfish and they would try to get him to confess and, and open up about things. And he, he would pull the whole, well, you can't tell me what I was going to do because you're not in my head. You can't mm -hmm. prove it. It's the same thing here. You, they can't prove that I was going to take pictures. Yeah. They don't know what I was going to do. But like you said, it's not about proving it with 100% certainty, like reading his mind mm -hmm. and knowing exactly what his intention was. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and his chat log said, I'm going to take pictures of us together. And boom, there's a camera. Right. There's a camera there. Yeah, exactly. So, of course, you're going to... Be saying, well, he brought the camera with him. Mm -hmm. So, and, and also, of course, he's going to say that's not why I was there. Right. It's all just a misunderstanding, just a, a disaster and, and a tragic, you know, course of events that destroyed his life. And none of it would have happened if he wasn't being trolled or his family didn't use him. And, you know, we know the whole mm -hmm. story. Well, not only would he say that he didn't intend to use the camera for that, we know he would have said, I never even meant to go there. I never even wanted to do it. Yeah. I wouldn't have done anything. Yeah. Which would destroy any any credibility he ever could have had with the jury because, mm -hmm. you know, take one look at the chat log. It's very, very clear what he wanted to do and what he intended to do. The right. box of condoms makes it pretty damn clear. Yes, it sure does what he intended to do. It sure does. And he has an argument against that as well. That's the thing, is that he has an argument for everything. Yeah, but they're really bad arguments. I mean, he could have said, I bought the condoms to use like balloon animals. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's an argument, but it's a, it's a bad one. It's sure. not convincing. Yeah. No, it's not. It's not going to convince anybody. And even with the bracelet, he said they asked him to bring her a gift. Mm -hmm. They did not ask him to, for that. He volunteered. He said, I'm going to bring you a present, too. So I think he even told her, I'm going to bring you a bracelet. Okay. So you, you know, so you'll have something to make you to remind you of me. <laughs> so corny. You know. But, I mean, truly like we were talking about before, this is Lauren's decision. He has to decide. And you're absolutely right in saying he didn't understand the magnitude of this charge that he was facing. And I think that that happens maybe a lot. I don't know. But mm -hmm. I read the book um, by Jody Aries's attorney, which was very interesting. And what he was talking about in general, and even as it relates to Jody, is that, you know, he's working with defendants who are facing the death penalty. So it's it's a massive case that he has to work with. But I think that the same principle applies is that the defendant has other ideas. Even, even somebody facing capital murder is thinking, what can I do to be found not guilty? <laughs> mm -hmm. And he's basically thinking like, 
I don't care about that. I'm trying to not have you go on death row. That's what I'm concentrating on. Um, there's obviously a hell of a lot of evidence for them to even bring this charge against you. Um, but th that's where the disconnect comes. And I think that the same thing is with Lorne as well. He's looking at this and thinking, I didn't do anything wrong. I talked to her and I exposed myself, but I didn't really want to. And I did it for all of these, you know, poor baby boy reasons of I wanted somebody to care about me without money and everything that we've heard a million times that all of these reasons are so ridiculous. But I think that that's what his entire thing is, is that he wants people to understand that, yes, he did those things. However, it's not what it looks like. He's not a predator. He didn't never wanted to hurt her. He wanted to go there because he didn't want to disappoint her. He had promised mm -hmm. that he would. And I wanted to make sure no one else was there hurting. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder where he got that excuse. Idiot. So, yeah, I mean, so I think that that is more important to him than looking at what's the reality of the situation. And the reality of the situation is that you're facing a, a ton of time in prison. And you're probably not going to be successful. You know, your best bet, according to the advice of the attorney, is to take this. Yeah, well, he really thinks that he didn't, what he did wasn't that bad. Mm -hmm. He says that in future, um, some future lawsuit or something that talking to a minor online isn't, isn't so bad. Mm hmm so I think he, I don't know, maybe is surprised that other people would think it's bad enough to um, to merit a, a multi-year jail sentence or prison sentence. Because he thinks also that the big mistake he made was going to the house. Yes, That yeah. was what put his nail in the coffin. But just exposing yourself to a minor online is a crime. Yeah, well, look at the parole hearing that we just went through. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Curcio never met his victim, didn't even know her name. Mm -hmm. And he was still arrested, went to prison. Yeah, I think Lauren thinks it is ridiculous that he served all those years in prison and is on the sex offender registry and is on lifetime probation for a crime that he didn't even get to commit in his mind. He didn't even get to. Exactly. That, yeah. That's a key word. <laughs> well, he certainly, yeah, that was his goal. But in, I, I think in his mind, he thinks he really didn't do anything that bad. He didn't actually touch anybody. Yeah, it's kind of like, remember when Maurice Wollen got arrested and he said, I didn't even do anything yet. <laughs> it's the same thing. Yeah, well, he wasn't being... And this is where Lauren's tiny little brain doesn't compute, but he wasn't being charged for doing these things. It was the attempt to do them, mm -hmm. you know, like with the production of the, um, the CP Yeah, that charge is just for the attempted production. Of right. CP. Right. He is goddamn lucky. That was a sting and not a real kid <clears throat> and not a real situation where he could, take those pictures. I know. Very lucky he is. Even though he wouldn't say that, he thinks he got screwed over. But what is the the alternative reality here? That what does he think? He he thought he could have gone to trial and been acquitted? Yes. That's With his exact sense that I never even wanted to go there. I never even wanted to. That camera wasn't there for that reason. Okay, throw out the whole um, production of CP charge. Okay. We'll, we'll pretend that doesn't. We'll pretend he has a good defense for that. Okay. He doesn't, but we'll pretend. Mm -hmm. 
the still he would still be found guilty for traveling for the the travel count he went there <laughs> <laughs> that is very true that is very true but you know it's it's difficult to really know what he was thinking because um when we when we take a look at the plea and when we take a look at the transcript of when the the plea was was read and agreed to in open court i think we're we're going to see a different lorn you know you you don't see the lorn that you hear on the phone calls where he has a lot of confidence in his defense and mm -hmm. you know the government is corrupt everyone is corrupt he had shitty lawyers they all work together with the judge and and everyone and i think when he's in in front of these people <laughs> he's a different person mm -hmm. you know i know that there's moments in in different reports of him um getting angry with probation and all of that mm -hmm. but i think he's a little bit different in front of a judge in a courtroom yeah yeah i'm sure he was crying the whole time yeah i'm sure that he was too i'm sure that he was too he's got to make himself look sympathetic but also Lauren really, really feels sorry for himself. Yeah, he thinks he really is the victim in all this. Mm -hmm. He genuinely does. We've talked about it a million times. He yeah. thinks he was targeted. He was the vulnerable one. Mm -hmm. And they were, he said that before, they were preying on him. Mm -hmm. They're the predators. He was Lord. Without realizing that saying, just by saying that, I was Lord there, he's saying he was Lord by the promise of a, a child. Yeah. 87. I know. <laughs> I know. He really is. But he can't see that. He can't see past his own victim mentality, his own victim narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now c continuing with the previous page, here's where it talks about what the judge can do. This means that if for any reason the judge does not accept the agreement, you can withdraw your plea of guilty. However, this judge rarely fails to accept a binding plea agreement of the parties. So he's letting them know that the judge doesn't have to accept it. Mm -hmm. And but he, he probably will. Right. He probably will. And if he doesn't accept it, then Lauren can withdraw his guilty plea and then plead not guilty and go to trial. Okay. Under the plea agreement, your total offense level would probably be 23 and your criminal history category one. This would normally result in an advisory sentence of 46 months imprisonment but you would be agreeing to a 60 month sentence in exchange for no further charges being brought and to make certain that any state time runs concurrently with your federal sentence. Okay. So here's where they're, they're making the deal a little bit sweeter and they're saying, okay, so given the score that they would be giving you, you could be facing 46 months, but they're going to give you 60 months and that's, that's not going to come, um, without, you know, things attached to it. Like they're not going to be able to come after you uh -huh. again, which is a major thing. Like you said, right. <laughs> right. Um, and to make sure that any state time runs concurrently. So that's where it's going to benefit him as well. Mm-hmm. So now, go ahead. Oh, I was just, I was just thinking, um, because Lauren said he didn't understand. His lawyer, you know, wasn't clear enough about everything. I think this is worded very clearly. It is. Where even someone as dumb as Lauren could understand. It is. That's why this is important to look at. Mm -hmm. Because for all of the crying that he does, all of the claims that he makes, 
that he had a shitty attorney and that person didn't have his back. He should have had someone else who would have helped him. It's all right here. They're, they're explaining it to you. You don't have a shitty attorney. You made the decision that was going to be the best one for you. That's what it comes down to. And granted, there's, there's nothing here that's great for Lauren. There's no, there's no silver lining. The only thing that he can look at with any hope is that if he went to trial and he was acquitted on both, which isn't going to happen. That's way out It's not going to happen. Right. But they told him about that. Mm-hmm. They gave him all of the all of the scenarios that could have happened at trial. Here's what happens if this. Here's what happens if that. They're, they're explained to him so clearly what his sentence is likely going to be and that this is the best thing for him to do because the government can't come after him after this. And also with the state time running concurrently, which the prosecutor said that would not happen if he didn't accept this. Mm-hmm. I'm sure this wasn't the only correspondence they had oh, about no. the plea. Right. I'm sure they talked face to face, you know, or on the phone mm-hmm. and the lawyer, you know, put it in even easier to understand terms and explain sure. to Lauren that this was his best bet. This was mm-hmm. the best he was going to get. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, this is just more of a formal, this is like right. a formal with um, attaching it to the plea agreement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Lauren must have known at the time that this was the best case scenario. Mm-hmm. Like I said, there's no way he thought that he could have been acquitted on the on the initial charge, the traveling charge at least. At least, yes. Yeah, I agree. Even though it's almost like he can't admit that. Well, I he pled guilty. I know, but that no, that's so true. Funny. That is true. No, he did plead guilty. But it's almost like even with that, he's saying, yeah, but not mm-hmm. really. <laughs> yeah, I think, like you said, he gets lots of, over the years. He's built up all this false confidence. Mm-hmm. It's his own confirmation bias. He's only looking at his own arguments and he thinks they're strong, which we know they're very weak. But I think he's just not thinking of the prosecution's potential arguments Mm -hmm. here, which are a a lot stronger than his. And the evidence supports them. All he has is, you know, I never even wanted to do it. I really didn't. You have to believe me. Yes. Yeah, you can't prove it. But that's but the thing is, they can. They can. Right. And he's not understanding what the standard is. Mm hmm. You know, it's not, it's not, a it's not removing all doubt. That's impossible to do. You know, so when they're, when the verdict is handed down, it's not, it's not because they're saying a hundred percent, they're saying beyond, they've proven it beyond a reasonable doubt that this mm-hmm. person is guilty. And that's the thing. All of the evidence against him is reasonable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's laughable that he would think otherwise. So the very last part is where they're tying it all together and bringing it to a close and saying the prosecutor is giving us a deadline of March 26, 2008 to accept this offer or it will be withdrawn. Please let John or me know if you wish to proceed no later than March 25th, 2008. Please call if you have any questions. If you would like to discuss this in person, I will come to Bowling Green. I bet he did. I just have a feeling. He did. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Get that tissue box. There's going to be some tears. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's the plea. The terms of the plea agreement um, and Lorne took it, but that is not the end of the story. 
No, it's far from the end of the story. I mean, clearly, we had a motion filed in 2024 that we took a look at. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely not over. Um, but this was this was the start of it. That's what's so interesting. He agreed to all this mm -hmm. and then turns around and says, actually, never mind. I changed my mind. I don't like that agreement anymore. He yeah. agreed to the lifetime probation mm -hmm. and the um, sex offender registry mm -hmm. and just decided now he can turn around and try to get that, um, you know, cleared away, which is, again, with this, uh, him trying to get off probation now to bring it to present day. Mm -hmm. it, he thinks, oh, how long ago did he go back to prison? 2019. Okay. So five years ago, he was, he was back in prison. He's on lifetime probation. Five years is nothing compared to that, you know, to say, yeah. oh, well, I've, uh, the last time I was in trouble was five years ago. No, maybe in 10 years, you can say that. Maybe in 15 years, you can say that. Five years is not, nobody's impressed by that, you know? No, definitely not. Yeah. And it, I, <laughs> I know that's the funny thing is that you were you were arrested for violating probation and you were put in prison again because of mm -hmm. as a punishment. So so yeah, it, it's funny that he is gonna he's just gonna keep asking. He's that guy, mm -hmm. you know. He's definitely that guy where. Most people wouldn't have the audacity to, to ask these really stupid questions, to ask yeah. for permission for something that you don't have the right to ask for. Right. During his revocation hearing, mm -hmm. he asked um, to have his um, term of lifetime supervised release um, shortened during the revocation hearing. Right. Yeah. What better time? Everyone's there. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it, it's arrogance and audacity and stupidity. Extreme. It, really, it must be. It, ha it has to be. It really does. And I think it's also, you know, he's talked, it's, it's like his little echo chamber because he's talked about how his mother and his aunt agree mm -hmm. that you know, the government is corrupt and probation is fucked up for doing this to him. And, you know, if, if you put my mother in front of my probation officer, my probation officer will get an earful. <laughs> like their opinions don't matter. No, well, it doesn't. It doesn't. And I think he was even told, like, why are you going to have your mother <laughs> go in and, and talk to them for you? Are you kidding? You're a grown yeah, man. He's something years old. Yes. And I also wonder how much of that would actually be true. Yeah, I get the feeling that his mother, he bitches all the time about probation and how unfair they are and how they're treating him bad. What did he say? They have an ax up against his head. Something that was like the that, phrase yeah. he kept using, some stupid phrase like, I'm not doing anything wrong. They're just messing with me. Mm -hmm. For, you know, for no good reason. And he's constantly talking about that. And his mother's just like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yep, show a lawn. You know, just kind of placating him. Yeah, I mean, she, because she's not, she's, uh, she's not like a, a doting mother who's going to be supportive no matter what their child does. Mm -hmm. She, and we've heard her talk like that, you know. Yeah. What is that? You're talking stupid. You're talking stupid. <laughs> yeah, I think most of the time she just doesn't want to deal with it. She doesn't want to deal with it. She's exhausted. Mm -hmm. This woman has lived a very long and busy life. Mm -hmm. You know, she's she had a lot of kids. She had a lot going on um, to try to manage things, you know, through the years. And she has this son who does not stop needing mommy and 
every time he brings up probation or class or court or anything like that, it's got to bring her mind back to the reason he's on probation to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. Which, you know, which I would think would be a really uncomfortable thing for a mother to think about. Yeah, I would be curious. I don't even think she watched the show. No, I don't think, I bet she didn't. She seems, um, what's the word? Not, maybe Mm non-confrontational. Yeah, she's just avoidant. Yes, avoidant. That would be the, that would be the word. You know, I just, I don't want to talk about that no more. I don't want to talk about that. I think that's her attitude with a lot of things. Yeah. A lot of unpleasant and uncomfortable things. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't think she has as much sympathy for Lauren as he wants to believe and as much as he wants other people to believe as well. Mm-hmm. I don't think she does. I think she thinks he's a huge pain in the ass and wishes he would just shut up. Yeah, I mean when when he told her about his drunk driving, she's just like, "Yeah, well, it's your fault. If you get arrested, what, you know, that's your fault. Yeah, if you get arrested, I'm giving that land to Roy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good riddance, you know? Yeah, I know. Exactly. And when he did go back to prison um, and he made her write a letter to the judge and read it in front of the judge, which must have been such an uncomfortable situation mm-hmm. for that old lady to have to stand up in front of a judge and come up with reasons why her son shouldn't be back in prison. And the reasons she gave were, I have to take care of, I have to deal with his responsibilities because he fucked up. I'm old. This is hard for me. It's inconveniencing me in my life. I have Mm -hmm. to take care of his dogs and I have to pay his bills Mm -hmm. and I can't. So can you, you know, you're punishing him, but you're punishing me too here. Right. So help me out. That, that was the only thing she said. Except for a couple, you know, thrown in there things like he bought her a refrigerator or something once. Mm-hmm. Like what, 25 years ago? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. He takes my trash out for me. Big fucking deal. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure anybody who's over there would take her trash out. <laughs> you don't need Lauren to come over to do that. Well, he is no, a I'm trash trying- panda. I know exactly. He took her trash out so we could dig through it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the reason why. And so we could brag about it for the next forty years. Yeah. I know. Well, remember when he was? I think he was going through his uncle Richard's stuff, and he found the Howard Hughes painting. Was it a painting? Maybe. I think it was. I can't remember. Yeah, I, re- I remember he was speaking to Ramona, and I think there was a painting, and also there were records. And he like immediately brought them to get them valued. Mm-hmm. So he could sell them. <laughs> so yeah, he's, he would definitely be digging through his mom's trash and all of that to try to get stuff. Yeah, absolutely he would. Yeah. He's a hoarder. (laughs) Making a mess like a raccoon. Exactly. She's like, Lon, get your ass out of my trash can. I told you before, I got ham in the fridge for the dogs. (laughs) I know. Oh, my God. So much. Poor lady. I... It's just, it's just exhausting. Like that's the one word that pops up into my head for his mother is exhaustion. Mm -hmm. You know, having to deal with this is just so much. All the time. It's it's shameful. Like all the time, all the time he spent in prison, writing her letters every single day, every time he wrote a letter bitching about the judge and the lawyers it would have to bring her mind around to what he did, Mm -hmm. the crime he committed. Mm -hmm. It's just a constant reminder. And he had nobody else to talk to but his mother, of course, 
because he, it's not like he has any friends or any fa- other family that would speak to him, but okay. he's just a huge burden on. He is. And speaking of talking to her, she would have had to pay for the phone bill. Oh my God. I know. And for stamps, stamps aren't free. Right. She paid for everything while he was in there. Yeah, she did. Who else is going to? No one. Yeah, no. Everyone said, bye, Lauren. Mm -hmm. (laughs) See you later, buddy. Yeah, nobody, nobody went to go see him. Um, Which, I don't know, to a certain extent, I can understand in a way. Um, yeah, because he was out of state. Yeah, yeah, it was far. But I would think, I don't know, maybe once a year. Plus, though, if you genuinely cared about somebody and you, you know, they were in jail, would you necessarily want to go and see them or prison? Um, I think that would be difficult. But if you did care about somebody, you would want to be supportive, mm-hmm. maybe, depending on what they did. Well, that's the part there, mm-hmm. depending on what they did. Yeah. That's what I, I that's what makes it really like messy and, and difficult for what I would think for his mother, because I think she would support him. She would, um, you know, go along with his excuses. But that crime of all crimes is is so awful. Yeah. I think what Lauren struggles with the most is, well, one of the things is that his expectation is that his life and his re- and his relationships just go back to what they were before. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, if you have Lauren as a brother, you're going to treat him like your brother, like you always did. You know, your your son, your nephew, your cousin, whomever, your uncle, that those relationships stay the same, that this is, you know, this is something that happened, but, you know, this is still Lorne. So your relationship to him is the same, but it's and not. And if your relationship changes, that means they never loved him to begin with. Correct. It's a, their problem. Mm-hmm. It's like when he talks about that one brother who was saying that he didn't have anything to do with Lauren because he wanted to impress his in-laws. Yeah. I know. It couldn't be because he was disgusted. Right. Exactly. Because he had children of his own and, and was, you know, just mortified and disgusted by that. It was just to put on a show. Yeah. But the expectation from Lauren is that it's just, it's the same. You know, even though it's, it's such a huge thing and that that would rattle anybody. Right. Nobody could ever look at him the same ever again, Mm -hmm. including his mother. Yeah. Everybody. His mother. Yeah. Even Roy. Even Even Roy, who seemed to be the most supportive, the most forgiving and like the most affectionate to Lauren. Mm Mm-hmm out of what we've seen in his family, even Roy would, you know, just in recent years run through Walmart to yelling about his brother, the pedophile. Um, the child perhaps, perhaps that was, um, that was influenced by a little bit of alcohol consumption. It I'm assuming. might have been <laughs> a little tipsy, a little bit. Roy, who can barely no, shows that's but... what he thinks. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely, yeah. So anytime there's going to be anger, that's going to come right to the surface. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so I mean, I I know that looking at a conviction such as that would be difficult for anybody to figure out. Well, how do I move forward from this? And it's, I think, you know, clearly you can make a decision of, I don't know that person. Mm -hmm. They're not a part of my life anymore. I don't know them. You can go that route, which certainly happens. And then there's the other route too, where perhaps you do want to move forward. It's difficult to let go. 
um, in particular, if that, if you've always had a good relationship with them Mm -hmm. and that's a part of your family or, you know, somebody close to you. The, the thing is, is that there has to be a way of moving forward, though, and knowing that your relationship is never going to be the same. That relationship is dead. Mm-hmm. So you have to figure out how to to move forward from that with something brand new. And that's the advice that I heard actually from from a podcast where this person gives relationship advice in particular um, for people who are married going through infidelity. Mm -hmm. What do you do? And the biggest thing that he tells them is you don't, your relationship isn't like that anymore. Mm -hmm. Who you guys were before doesn't exist. So now there has to be the decision made of what do you do now? And I think that that advice carries through to a lot of relationships, not just a marriage with, you know, infidelity, but a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And he's even talked about um, people who have sex offenders in the family. And what do you do? You know, because people really struggle with that. And I and I can understand. Oh, I definitely. Ha- yeah. yeah. I have a friend who, who went through that with her family where one day randomly this cousin of hers who was an adult, I want to say he was probably in his 40s maybe, um, just came out and said that this uncle molested him when he was a kid. Mm -hmm. And it was so shocking because this uncle was very central to the family. He had um, the type of home where All of the holidays were over there and he would have these massive picnics and everybody loved him and he was very outgoing and, you know, fun. And all of a sudden this, this cousin comes out and said, this happened to me. And people didn't know what to do with that, you know, because not only are you thinking about this incident, but you're also thinking about your relationship to that person or with that person. Um, and some people were obviously very angry and said, that's not my uncle anymore. I don't know who that is. And maybe things have changed because that can be an initial reaction as well, which is understandable. Nobody knows how to deal with it um, until it happens. Mm -hmm. And then there were other people who were still like, this is still my uncle. And I remember that my friend had a brother who had a young son that was still going to have a relationship with him, even though oh. the crime, right, that gives you the the yucks, right? Mm-hmm. Because the, the crime was specifically surrounding a young boy. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of people or some people don't know how to, like you said, um, change the relationship. So they're going to just kind of pretend it didn't happen, avoid the topic and try to keep things the same Mm -hmm. as they always were. Yeah. Focus on what the relationship was before, what it was Mm -hmm. yesterday before you found out. Yeah. I think that's what Lauren's mother does. She, she just avoids and tries to pretend it didn't happen. Mm Mm-hmm. I, the alternative I, th- I think would be too painful. First of all, it'd be too much work because there's, you know, you'd have to talk about that. That would, there would be lots of really difficult discussions that Lauren isn't going to entertain anyway. Right. He just wants to hear his mother say, you know, yeah, yeah, I know. I know when he cries and says, I wouldn't have done it. I love kids. Mm hmm. She's just going to say, yeah, 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 Lauren, I know. It'd be a lot harder to have an honest conversation about it. Um, Mm -hmm. And too painful, of course. And I feel like there would probably be a lot of guilt on her part. I'm not saying that she should feel guilty. I'm not saying she did anything wrong. But I think most mothers would think, like, what, where did, where did I go wrong? What did I miss? I did something wrong to, for my child to turn out like this. Yeah. Your kids are a reflection of you. And then you think back to 
oh, wait a minute, maybe I should have paid more attention to this incident when he was 12, or there was that one time when this happened and I ignored it. I brushed it under the rug. Maybe I should have gone deeper. Yeah. You know, all those feelings of this is my fault. Yeah. Because I've raised this person. It's a lot easier to just say, you know, I don't want to think about that. I don't want to talk about that no more. Yeah, I think it is too. And and I also think that Lorne, when he gets going, not in answering the difficult questions because he won't do that, but when he's projecting and he's attacking others, he'll talk all day. And I'm sure that at the beginning, maybe she listens a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's how she was going to deal with it and be like, well, I can't do anything, but I can talk to him on the phone. Mm -hmm. So she probably did listen to a lot of his bitching and a lot of his I never even meant to's. And this is what I'm going to do to get out of here. But I think after a while, it's just enough. Because he's blaming everybody else for it. Correct. Too. Yeah. And she knows that, that that's not correct. You know, when he's blaming his siblings and blaming anything and anyone but himself, maybe he can blame perverted justice and NBC mm-hmm. and the sheriff's department. She doesn't know those people. But when he starts blaming his siblings... She knows that situation, what really happened with the meatballs. Uh Uh-huh. You know, and she knows that that's not a valid excuse for what he did. Right. I know. I know. He was trying to buy their love. Mm -hmm. Obviously. And it was obvious to her, too. Because she's going to be hearing it from them as well. Right. Well, he, she told him, if you were stupid enough to do that, then it's your own fault. Mm-hmm. If, and I think what she was talking about was the money in the Betty situation. He Definitely. gave them the money. Yes. And then realized, oh, I have to pay bills and the job isn't done and I have no money. I gave it all away. Yeah. And she said, well, you were the dummy who did it. It's your own fault. As is the way with everything. Mm-hmm. It seems. I mean, I can't think of it being any other way. That is for sure. So, I suppose that's where we'll leave it for now. And next time, we will go through said plea agreement. So, I think we have a good understanding of what he was being um, told by his attorney. Mm -hmm. that this wasn't just somebody who wasn't giving him any sound advice. The thing is the, the attorney can't tell him what to do. Right. It's his decision. He can just advise him. And he did outline it very, very well. And like you said, that's not going to be the first time that he's hearing about this. They would have had those conversations. I'm sure that, that they had a lot of conversations of what's going to happen now, you know, what's going to happen to me. And when they were talking to the government, I'm sure, again, that, you know, this plea agreement didn't just happen. There had to have been some type of conversation, you know, back and forth. Negotiation, if you will. Yeah, the document was um, dated March 8th, right? Um, Yes. And then they had had to um, let the prosecutor know by the 26th. Mm -hmm. So he had, you know, they had time to discuss this and Mm -hmm. to go over everything. It's not like the, he presented it to him and said, you better give us an answer right now. You don't have time to think about it or go over the, the other, um, options or the alternatives in your head. There was time. Yeah. But there is Lauren rewriting history yet again. Mm -hmm. (sighs) So, yeah. All right. Well, we have a lot to look forward to. Do and we're gonna look forward to the government's answer coming up soon. Mm-hmm. Oh my God! I know. I can't wait. I know. I know. So anyway, that's what we will be waiting for. And until then, take care. <laughs>